Lore Together is proud to be part of the Boss Rush Games Network. Feel free to find out more at bossrushgames.com slash network. Hi, I'm Safi. And I'm Mystic. And this is Lore Together. This is the podcast where husband and wife team go over all the storytelling, world building, and characters of video games, because it's what we like to do together. We lore together. Yep, and it's episode 92. It's getting through the 90s. 92 was a decent year. <laughs> decent, yeah, overall. All right, so don't you have a spiel you're supposed to go through? If you'd like to contact us, you can do that in multiple ways. Links for Twitter, Instagram, Mastodon, Reddit, YouTube, and Steam are all down in the description below. Or you can do that through email at loretogether at gmail.com. Yeah, feel free to contact us, but we are going to be busy yes. soon. I'll, also, is it Twitter still? Is it X? I don't know, but... Oh, I'm calling it Twitter. It's the same reason why I still call it the Sears Tower. It's just, I'm just <laughs> that stubborn. It's still Comiskey Park. I don't care what they name it. I'm. It's just one of those things. It's still going to be Twitter to me. Moving on. And if you like to support the podcast, you can do that in one of two ways, or two of, two of two ways. Two of two ways is even better. You can give us a thumbs up, five stars, good rating, wherever you're listening, however you're listening, we appreciate it. The other way you can support us is through Patreon at patreon.com slash loretogether, where you can pay a per episode pledge to get early access to episodes, as well as mini episodes, which we have one coming up soon, and access to our early access to our Let's Plays, including... Lorik's Adventures in Skyrim, My Firmament Let's Play, and Safi's Let's Play of the Dragon Age series, which we will be getting back to all of those once we're back from Gen Con. Gen Con is a vacation where we have to do homework. <laughs> we love this type of homework because that's just the weirdos that we are. Hence why you're listening to us evaluate storytelling in video games, because that's just... We lore together, and... <laughs> That's part of what we do at Gen Con. So, I think... So, what are we covering this time? Do you remember? Oh, my gosh. Of course I remember. <laughs> okay. So, this is part two of our look at the Elder Dragons in Guild Wars 2. Yes. And this is the more packed episode. Yikes. So, in episode one, we covered the history. Yes. And, a little, like, the history, which is revealed through Guild Wars 2, but... Mm -hmm. You know, the bits and pieces of the history. We covered the basics of Guild Wars 2 with the races, and we covered everything up fr from Zaitan up through the awakening of Modramoth. Yes, pretty so much. So that is basically the base game plus season one. Yes. We are going to be covering season two, <laughs> Heart of Thorn, season three, um... I'm having trouble remembering the third expansion right now. Uh, we literally had this on our live stream <laughs> like a week ago, and we can't even remember it. This is pathetic. But so uh, it's it's fire or something. I can't remember off the top of my head right now. I'll remember later in whatever. Is it Emblem or no. Embers? Okay. No. And so season four, Ice Brood Saga, and End of Dragons. <laughs> so we're covering four seasons. Wait, seasons three We're covering seasons. four seasons, and... Three expansions and a mini expansion type thing. Why are thing. you doing this to yourself? <laughs> Why? Why would you torture yourself like this? Did you just want to make sure you earned your vacation? <laughs> maybe. maybe. Like, why would you? Why would you do that to yourself? I'm just so. I'm so confused. All right. Well. Path of Fire. Path of Fire is the, the second expansion. I'm, I'm glad that you've you saved your honor on that one. Yes. So. All right. So last time, like I said, we covered, we, we ended covering Scarlet Briar. Don't forget that if you haven't listened to episode 91 yet. You probably should. Now is your time to pause here. Listen to it in your preferred podcasting distributor, whatever that may be. And then come back to this episode <laughs> so you know what's going on. Don't do what Safi's about to do and try to remember it off the top of your head and probably fail. <laughs> it's only, it, it, it's better than when I covered in 91, we were covering stuff that we last covered in 45. So Yeah, 
<laughs> you think I'd give myself some time to like do a refresher course now that I know what the part two is? No, I have not. <laughs> I've not learned from my mistakes previously, but continue. Okay, so we covered Scarlet Briar and her crazy machinations that end up waking up the Elder Dragon, Modramoth, but we didn't really delve into the guild that forms to challenge her throughout that whole season. Oh, okay. Yeah, so at this point in the story, they're not officially named or even an actual guild. It's just like a group mm-hmm. of people working together. Yeah. But we're going to refer to the group by the name they adopt later on, Dragon's Watch. Okay. So, though it eventually will grow to 10 full and de facto members and one former, we're not going to even touch on any of that. Okay. Yeah. We start with just five outside of the player character who we'll call the commander because they're kind of the commander of the pact in a way. I hear, and you may mention this later in your script later on, because you become the commander, there's some great voice acting uh, Easter eggs that happen. Yes. Um... I believe it's either Path of Fire or in season four, Kimberly Brooks plays a NPC. Yes. Who refers to as Commander, and she played Ashley Williams in Mass Effect. It's kind of cool. Also, I believe Queen Jenna will call you Commander at some point. I may be mistaken, but she played Shepard. So. Yes. <laughs> or Femshep in Mass Effect. Yes, because Jennifer Hale did Femshep. And if you'd like to hear more of Jennifer Hale, we are current, I think we're starting episode two will be up by the time people hear this, of yes. our Mass Effect Let's Play. Yeah, our alternate Thursday Let's Plays is, we we were, the voters agreed on our Patreon that Fem Shep was how we were going to proceed, and there's a couple of decisions they've already made about who she yep. is, and there'll be more decisions along the way, but Fem Shep is the way that we're going. But it doesn't mean we don't hear Mark Muir in the series. It's true. He is there. He's Vorcha. He's all the Vorcha, yeah. It's crazy. But we won't hear him, I think, until Mass Effect 2. I think, I think he's other additional voices in Mass Effect 1, but Vorcha is probably the one that stands out. Yeah, Mark Muir is definitely like a jack-of-all-trades in voice acting. <laughs> anyway, so our Dragon's Watch guild at this point is Bram Erson, a young male Norn guardian. Guardian is a class. Yeah. And son of Destiny's Edge guild member, Arista Galkin. Oh. He's brash and cocky and looking to make his own legend. Fair enough. Casimir Mead, a female human mesmer. Mesmer is probably the most interesting class, I feel. Because it's the illusion class, technically, but it's, right? It's probably the only one that's purely guild wars. Yeah. You know? I would agree. Yeah, not. It doesn't really have any roots to anything else. Very specifically, like illusionist is something that comes up in yeah. like Dungeons and Dragons. It's like a specialty usually or something like that. But it's not quite as the like same. the entire basis for a class. You don't see that very often. Yeah. So she is a very powerful mesmer at that. Casimir was born into a noble family, but everything was taken from her. And we're not going to cover all of these individual characters. I just figure we're, these names will come up to a degree so in case my friend from college ever hears this yes that was also the concept for your character in our <laughs> D&D campaign I acknowledge that you did it first Marjorie Delacroix a female human necromancer of Canton descent who is a private investigator also by this point Casimir and Jory are a couple oh so and then we have Rox a female char ranger Rox is a gladium a char with no warband. And, uh... Oh! Yeah. Hmm. She's looking for one, basically. And lastly, Timey, a young female Asura who has a huge interest in Scarlet Briar and is a technological whiz, as many Asura can be. There's more. We're not going to touch on everybody. Bram is probably the one we'll touch on the most. <laughs> yeah, and I'm still not going to remember everybody's names, Mystic, so please, like... Mm-hmm. And audience, please, just deal Be- bear through if there's a lot deal. going on in Zachary my head these days deal. so we do also get more granular in this episode than we did with zaitan so zaitan sounds like a chewing gum brand <laughs> i was i keep i might have said something else in the last episode but like that name i was like that doesn't sound right yeah. it sounds like something that cleans my teeth so some months after the attack on lion's arch mm-hmm 
that woke Mardermoth, the Pact, the group that'll become known as Dragon's Watch, began focusing to the west in an attempt to put on Mardermoth before it can actually, like, really rise. It's just kind of, like, rumbling at this point. Right. However, the effort resulted in a failure when the Pact airship fleet was destroyed by Modrum vines, kind of just surging from the growth. Whoa. And from Silvari saboteurs who have been taken over by their original master's influence. The original master's influence? So if you remember back in the last episode, the pale tree, which is the mother of all the Silvari, was actually from a grove. Of, yes. From a seed cave that was guarded by the Modrum. Oh, yeah. It was the rogue plant amongst all the other yes. trees, right? Okay. For all the pale tree taught them, Modromoth is still the OG, basically. <laughs> Yes. Uh, luckily, this is not... Wait, wait, wait. Assuming direct control. <laughs> Assuming direct control. Yeah, of course you do it better. L- I still did it terribly. Luckily, this was not compulsory. Many were able to resist, even though they could still hear the voice. We do have a couple characters. Uh, Kanak is one who is like, I can hear it like a needle. It, fe- like, it feels like a voice always in my head. That so. sounds like the calling, almost. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Obviously, this co- did cause a lot of suspicion of the Silvari in general. Yes. Um, in fact, there's a sequence that you can follow in Lion's Arch of two guards on patrol and the destroyed Lion's Arch. Yeah. And, like, everything's going fine. It's it's just two guards on patrol helping people, blah, blah. And then there's a Silvari. And one of them just is like, this is going to be the next Scarlet. We have to like call this in. We have to take them out and all this other stuff. And like the young upstart, it's like, no, you stand down. This is not what we're doing type stuff. Right. So yeah, they, Guild Wars sometimes doesn't put its best story out in the forefront. Sometimes it's just listening to NPCs and seeing what they do. <laughs> I really like that, though. I think it makes it interesting, and it gives more of a reason to come back other than, like, I need my daily fix of, like, points and gold and gems and stuff. It also makes the world feel alive. Yes. It makes the world feel more real. So during the push into the Maguma jungle, we become aware of the fact that Glint, if you remember, Glint was the champion of Kral Katorik. And was previously part of... Glint was Kral Katorik's champion until... Basically, her she was freed from his control. His thrall, kind yeah. of, right? Yeah. So Glint has another egg in the world, and Vlast, who we covered last time briefly, yes. is not her only child. Oh. The egg is taken by the Savari named Kaith, a member of Destiny's Edge and major player so far, deep into the jungle. We follow her even coming into contact with the Exalted, whom we mentioned were servants of the Forgotten and caretakers of Vlast. Okay. We eventually find Kaith, knocked out after being attacked by a twisted creature that used to be a Silvari. Oh, wow. So what's a... Does it look like a regular Silvari? Just no, weird- it's like this weird, uh, like, spiky monster and everything, but it has, like, a giant Silvari face on it. And, in fact, it's her former lover. I mean, so... Whoa! Oh my gosh. Yeah, there's a lot more we're not going into, but yeah. Is it sad that the first thing I thought of was the uh, flower archetype of of um, career in Metopia? <laughs> Next to Kaith is Glint's egg. We grab the egg, the power from it leeching into us as we make haste to the exalted city of Tarir. There, the egg is set up in a special chamber and watched over by the Exalted. Modramoth was ultimately killed by Dragon's Watch in 1328 AE. Unfortunately, to fully destroy Modramoth, it was necessary to kill Marshal Traherne. We mentioned him in the last episode. He is the one who kind of leads the pact. Okay. He had, he had kind of fused with the dragon. He Whoa. was Silvari, so it wasn't exactly hard. Right. Dragon's Watch takes its name at this point and is officially formed by the commander and Ritlock Brimstone of Destiny's Edge. He is he is probably the one that of all the race mentors cuz each when you start a character your race you have a mentor. Keith yes. is the Savari mentor, Ritlock is the Char mentor, Zoja is the Asura mentor, Logan Thackeray is the human mentor and Norn, who's Norn? Air. 
Okay. Er Stagalkin is the Norn mentor. Uh, Ritlock is the one who kind of sticks around the most, and it's kind of a pleasure to hear Steve Blum's voice the whole time. Oh, nice. Uh, another Mass Effect reference. He plays Grunt, so... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> of course he's playing Ritlock. That's just a yeah. perfect fit of his skills. As with Zyten, Modromoth's magic surged out across the world. Some of it was absorbed by Glint's egg. Traherne was succeeded as Pact Marshal by Logan Thackeray, and as we said, also formerly a member of Destiny's Edge. Basically, Destiny's Edge becomes the pack, becomes your mentor. <laughs> okay, yeah, that makes sense. It's not long before Glint's egg hatches into her second scion, Orin, who chooses the pack commander, player character, as her champion. Okay. Around this time, Primordus and Jormag become more active. Uh, fire and ice, basically. Yes, Jormag, yes, yeah. which is still in Norn territory right now, right? Jormag, yes. Um, both of their minions are exhibiting signs of having absorbed death and plant magic, though. Right. These signs were more prevalent in Primordus's minions than in Jormag's, leading to speculation that proximity to the released magic has a big role to play in that aspect. All right. Timey ends up building a machine to access the eternal alchemy. Wow. <laughs> Not unlike Omad. But rather than peer into the underlying fabric of reality and going crazy, she plans on using this machine to turn Jormag and Primordus's energies against one another, which would Ooh. wind up killing them both in the process. Okay. Unfortunately, she soon discovered that doing so might have very catastrophic consequences, basically unraveling the eternal alchemy and destabilizing it. <laughs> so there's a balance of the force, so to speak. Yeah, it's one thing... That the dragons die. It's another if you play with quantum physics to do it. <laughs> well, I think that just makes logical sense overall. Yeah. Uh, problem is, by the time she ran the simulations and found this out, the machine was stolen, and you will never guess by who. We have mentioned this character, but it's way back in episode 45. <laughs> oh, no. I'm definitely not going to remember. By the fallen god of war, Balthazar. Um, excuse me, who? <laughs> What? So the humans have got have different gods. Yes. And the god of war is Balthazar. He is a fallen god at this point and basically like pseudo mortal, etc. And just steals it. <laughs> you make it sound like just steals it is like she looked away for a minute and then he said yoink and ran away. Okay, no. No, there's a but. bit of a there's a bit of a task, but he decided he heard about this, decided to steal it, made the efforts. And yeah, the so machine. Okay. the one thing I'm I'm not really delving into here is I don't remember if this is the scene, but sometimes the voice acting in this game is just on point. You get a lot of radio communications, quote unquote. Yeah, and. Sometimes, like, when something happens, you just get some, like, blood-curdling screams, and this happens to Timey at one point. It's just like, oh, God, let's go fix this. <laughs> like, Oh, no. But, yeah, all the voice actors are great. The writing sometimes is a little sappy, but that's... <laughs> They're allowed to have sappy yeah. writing. I think that's part of the appeal. And it's, it's, Gil it's intentionally sappy. Yeah. You know it's intentionally sappy when characters comment that, that like, oh, I feel warm and fuzzy now. Like, <laughs> Right. I think Guild Wars kind of has that aesthetic and they kind of lean into it just a little bit. Yeah. Because most of the other, I think most of the other popular MMOs don't really lean into that as much. Yeah. Guild Wars is fine playing dark mm -hmm. and really depressing. And there's a lot, there are so many introspective moments for the player character throughout the whole franchise and there's dark memories and moments and everything and then they balance it with just some sappy stuff once in a while <laughs> lots of lots of uh friend like friends are awesome type stuff okay anyway so he stole this machine and traveled to the ring of fire where primordus has basically relocated and attempts to use the machine to kill both primordus and jormag not realizing it's going to undo the universe in an attempt to steal their magic for himself is well, I wonder if there is a way to do that. Now, not to say that this wanna be a god again boy, man thing, yeah. should 
get this power. But I wonder if there's a way you could do it in a way where it's an equilibrium and you're centralizing both of their power within one person. So we're not actually... So Balthazar was in... Basically, it was basically in prison. Mm-hmm. And was basically sent there by the gods and was freed by a mortal. We're not going to tell you who. Okay. Because that's going to be a whole separate episode at some point probably. But was freed as a mortal who didn't know what he was doing because Balthazar just looked like an old man in prison in like this, in the mists. And yeah, it's basically somebody got tricked to freeing the fallen god of war who then starts to wreak havoc. Yeah. Fallen gods tricking you into freeing them and sympathizing with them is one of my favorite tropes ever. I don't know why, but just this this <laughs> idea of somebody was like, oh no, I just met you and you're totally appealing 100% to my sensibilities in this moment. Of course we're now instantly friends. And then to be you're like, oh no! Oh, How no. did this happen? It's like I have something you want. Yeah. And it is a thing that is tied entirely to your self-identity. It's like an object that was lost in the mists. Like, this is tied to your self-identity, your racial identity, and also one of the main weapons for your race. (laughs) Oh, my God. Oh, wow. No, I'm just actually... So, it just reminds me of... So, uh, you, you guys have heard that I'm into Critical Role, and there's a short four episode series called Exandria Calamity that kind of plays with this trope. I don't want to say too much because technically it's a little bit spoilery. After we record Mystic, let me tell you about it because it's it's good. So meanwhile, while all this is going on in the far Shiver Peaks, Bram and his Norn companions, basically Bram's like, you guys aren't doing enough. I'm going to go off and, you know, have my own guild. Uh, which he, which they you're not a bad enough dude. So they literally are calling themselves Destiny's Edge. (laughs) Oh my god! Because at this point he's a bit of a tryhard, so he just takes the name of his mother's guild. Oh wow! Um, it's understandable he's a bit of a tryhard and Broody McBruderson at this point uh, for events we're not going to cover, but it makes sense character-wise. It's just like I wish you would not do that. <laughs> well, yeah, and it makes yeah. it makes your investment in them wishing they would better themselves even more compelling. Yeah, so they they're hunting a drum egg and have it surrounded. Doesn't go according to plan. Uh, and though Balthazar was stopped, the machine is destroyed. The Elder Dragons are both wounded, though, by this whole thing, and Balthazar managed to absorb a significant portion of their magic before he also disappeared. Wait, so, he disappeared? Yeah, he's like, I'm going to go do my own thing right now. He'll, he'll come back, don't worry. Oh, I know he'll come back. I just, like, I didn't expect him to just disappear. I thought he would... More like we lose track of him. Okay, that's different. So the Elder Dragon's energy subside to pre-awakening levels, and they go dormant, although their minions remain active all over the world. Kralkatorik, who has become active after preserving a portion of magic released by Mojomo's demise, moves south to Prophet's Fall, and basically moves down to the Crystal Desert to the Domain of Vabi. This will become important later to a degree. Um, I don't know if I'll mention Domain of Vabi again, but basically he's down in the desert. Okay. And... In the Crystal Desert is where Balthazar shows back up with his forged army. Oh. Basically, like, mechanized fire and everything army. Who kill Vlast. No! <laughs> as part of their campaign against Krakatork. No! So. No! And Krakatork is brought close to death by Balthazar's forged war beast, basically this giant thing, which used a captured Orin... Oh. Yeah, we're skipping a lot of stuff because we have too much. Uh, basically, captures Orin at some point in order to exploit Kralkatorik's weaknesses, since Kralkatorik is basically Orin's grandfather, when I mean, you think about it. Yeah, okay. Uh, there sense. is some magical, like, synergy there. So, Balthazar is eventually killed by Orin and the Pact Commander, and it's kind of like, it's ridiculous. Like, you're going to face the God of War by yourself? Yep. <laughs> like... Yep, that's the whole premise to a series we should be covering at some point, God of War. We would need a Sony console. We do not have one. Oh, and if you'd like to get us a Sony console... (laughs) Please support support our Patreon, yes. Support our Patreon. Um, But yeah, Balthazar's eventually killed, and even just... So we have skipped over... (laughs) 
one of the greatest characters. We're skipping over, like, he, this character deals with Balthazar. He is a main antagonist after Balthazar. We're talking about Palawa Joko, Praise Joko. We're not going to even touch him. He is the best antagonist we've seen <gasps> oh, up I rem- to this point. I remember <laughs> seeing a bunch of the voice actors being forced to say, Praise yes. Joko. It's so, it's so funny. They're having so much fun acting that out. It's hilarious. Uh, there are... Yeah, Joko is great. We will cover Joko at some point in the future. Because he's also back in Guild Wars 1. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, he's a lich. He like... <laughs> oh, liches. Oh, man. So, Balthazar's magic, basically, because he absorbed all the magic, so from Primordius and Dromag to a degree, it's released and absorbed by Kralkatork and Orin, who both just Now, is fly this off. like a Night Sweats release, like the dragons? <laughs> or are we... <laughs> No, like hit, like it's like when Zaitan and Modroth die, it's like like wave of magic. It's a wave of yeah. energy release. Okay. So, as Kralkatork flies south through the rest of the Crystal Desert, mm-hmm. the colors of the crystals change. Like the crystals that he is spewing, the crystals on him all change, and he's bringing dead things back to life as in the brand. Oh. So, like, he has the power of the of of Zaitan now. He has the plant thing. Like, yeah, it's yes. Yeah. Irene also grows significantly after absorbing this magic. She is much larger. Oh wow! <laughs> so yeah, uh, still a kid. At this point, I put her at like she's not. At, she's playful when she's younger. Now she's more like angsty teen still can't talk though well, 13 14 ish probably yeah still can't talk though mm-hmm. um well it sounds like she grew up super fast yes uh basically magic make gr- make dragon grow large uh fair very fair <laughs> krakatork begins experimenting on his new powers sending brand storms throughout the crystal desert region and was believed to roost in the mountains west of the domain of Korna. now that is one of my least favorite areas in the whole game, so we're gonna skip past that. <laughs> we're just gonna skip past something. No, we're not. We're not like skipping it. past the story, but yeah, I'm not gonna go into it too much. Okay. Uh, in a weird twist, it was revealed that Krolikatork had abandoned Tyria from this point. Wow. And traveled into the mists. Now, the mists are a primordial proto reality. <laughs> oh. Okay, can you explain it, yeah. further? So it's the space between realities. It's liminal space. Not entirely. There are things there too. Hmm. Um, it's where souls go. It's where time and space collide. It's where battles between realities are fought in the mist war. That's basically the PvP and the world versus world is the mist war. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Yeah, everything that was, is, and ever will be is formed from the mists, and by traveling the mists, you can bridge realities and times. Like, yeah, it's... So it is... It's quantum foam. <laughs> that's that's the best description of that. I want quantum foam now. That sounds like the best toy ever. Quantum and, foam. Yeah, basically, venturing through the mists is a big deal. So now Kralkatoric is an elder dragon with a huge appetite... And with the magic game from Balthazar, he's able to fly around the mist and begin feeding on what is essentially the entire multiverse. <laughs> now, Spider-Man fans, is this a canon event? <laughs> I need to know. <laughs> so it's actually around this time that Oreen actually speaks her first words. Basically, aspects of her grandfather, again, Krakatoric, manifest during an encounter. She basically brands over like fissures wow. and all the other people are sitting there arguing about this as like is Irene going to follow in his footsteps like how much how much is nature how much is nurture well yeah like, but there's two generations separated at this point right yeah it kind of feels a little bit like um that one TNG episode where Deanna Troy has a baby and everyone's sitting there talking about what we're going to do with the kid and it just the camera just kind of zooms in on her as she's sitting there silently thinking, and then she speaks up. This is kind of what it feels like. So, 
I isn't that like in the first season or so? I think it's the first episode of the second season. So it's not a great it's, episode. No, it's not a good episode. There's a lot of reasons why I don't like that episode. It's just oof. Yeah. But anyway. basically everyone's talking about something that deals with you and no one's getting your input. Right. So well, I'm also. It also feels like a little bit like some of what you described in Tales of Bas- Basaria, mm. with um, the character who was revealed to be the um, unborn child spirit. Oh, Lafayette. Lafayette. I'm sorry. I'm. It's. I'm. I forget which episode that I was, was. I was amazed you pulled that out of nowhere. Even so, <laughs> because the concept of it was just so crazy, and now I'm hearing about it again, and it hasn't been yeah. that long when you think about it. Between I think it was Luffy said. I don't know. It, the, the, I forget the names from that episode. All I remember is meow. So that's episode sixty nine. If you're interested to know about what I'm talking about, Tales of Berseria. Yeah. Yes. Um. No, it's not Luffy because that's the uh, brother of Velvet. Man, does name still bother me? But <laughs> either way. But yeah, it's there. They had like a there was like a cousin situation or something there that was. Oh not yeah, yeah. Born, okay. And it, that spirit didn't speak either, and was like was uncertain and basically just followed directions. And it feels, yeah, it it, a it, similar... it feels like if it, it looks like Lafayette though when we see him. That's yes. Yes. Yeah. But it feels like a it feels like a similar vibe going on. Here. Um. Yeah, no. All I remember from Tales of Berseria is meow. Uh, you know, there were so many other beautiful things that happened in that game. I know, game. but that was the end of our stream, and you hated that. Oh, God, it hurts so much. Let's let's talk about Guild Wars Two before okay. I start hurt, being so, in pain again. Irin is understandably frustrated by this, and Kaith, okay. who's there. Offers herself to Irene as a vessel to speak through, willingly stepping into Irene's brand. Oh wow! Yeah, and it's it's an awesome scene. Uh, teal crystalline flower. So Kate is Silvari; she's a plant person. But yes. teal crystalline flowers blossom all over Kate. Oh wow! Yeah, and there's this deep mental and emotional bond that joins her and Irene from this point out. So, very different from the violent subjugation of Kralikotorik's brand. So, so obviously, Irene is not going to be like her yeah. grandfather, so to and speak. And literally, her first words are, I am not him. Right. So, uh, Kate will not be her voice forever. She does eventually talk on her own. But... Considering nobody really taught her how to speak, she's got to learn for <laughs> imitation first. You know what? To... to Set, cement home how this works like you have to like play games with Orin. okay like yeah, as, that makes a, sense. as a little kid when like when she's a little tiny dragon you like play hide and seek with her i think and stuff oh they kind of learning bring, through play this yeah. is something i've been hearing a lot about recently they kind of bring this back when you're training a is it the sky scale yeah you're you have a sky scale mount and you can kind of play fetch with it and stuff to Aww. as a mission to help it learn. Yeah. P.S. Learning through play, legit cool stuff to hear about. Yes. It's actually fascinating. But moving on into the video game. So with a dragon that can now talk. <laughs> Talking dragons. <laughs> Whoever heard of that? Everybody. Everybody has. Yeah. They form a plan. And together with the Pact, the Olmakan Char... The Order of the Sun Spears and the Zephyrites. Yes, I know we haven't covered some of those. Suffice to say, there's a lot of different groups working together. <laughs> right. Um, the Dragon's Watch Guild succeeds in tracking and luring Kralkatork out of the mist to trap him underneath Thunderhead Peaks. Oh. Okay. Unfortunately, the battle ends disastrously. Okay. Orin and many other combatants are killed. Oh, no. Turned to crystal or impaled by crystal. In fact, like, Orin is just, like, crystals, like, sh- spiked through her and everything. Oh, yeah. that's so awful. The guild's morale is shattered until the next episode. Uh, though, keep in mind, if you play this when it's coming out, we're talking a couple months between episodes. Oh, wow. <laughs> but when I was playing it, it was like, boop, and... Orin's alive. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, because if you weren't waiting in real time, the suspension is right. This is kind of like I had a friend who I ended up watching all of Farscape with, and he was a he was a OG fan, and he was watching it with me like years after it finished, 
And they had to wait two years between the end of the last season of Farscape and the movie that pretty much helped conclude the series in a satisfying way. He goes, you have to understand, not only did we wait two years, we didn't know we were going to get this movie. Yeah. So it was a wait for something that we had no idea what might be coming or not. It was just... I mean, at least with this, even though you might have had to wait in real time, you they know, knew it was coming. You yeah. knew it was coming. So, uh, you know, Arena's alive. It's that sounds. It's more complex than even just saying that sounds. Um, like, I don't want to. Was get she it. ever really dead? Is yes. a good question. Oh, yes, she was really dead. D e d dead. Okay. But I'm not going to get into how she's back alive because that would cover that would basically spoil a story I want to cover at a future time. <laughs> well, it just I think it also shows how much Mystic you love this game because there's so many parts where you're like I don't want to get into that story, and I feel like part of it is just this idea of you should experience for yourself if you truly can, and you usually don't here's feel that strongly about here's that. A, here's the thing: if I am going to say, let's say. Dragon Age, Mass Effect, Guild Wars. Yeah. Which game is the better, most awesome experience? Mm-hmm. I'm going to tell someone to play Mass Effect. Right. You know, if somebody wants what is the deeper RPG, Dragon Age. Yeah. If somebody wants something that, that is a longer burn, you know, not always playing the, you like, you don't always have to play the story. You can play whatever you want. You can go do what you want and you can come back to that story and there's stuff to learn, there's lore to dive into, there's threads woven throughout Guild Wars. Like, <laughs> You know what this kind of... It, it feels also kind of like a pulpy in tone more so than like Dragon Age it is, Mass it is, Effect is. We are definitely talking more pulpy, a little bit more, you know, you can sometimes see the tropes but they play with it type yeah. stuff. And I and and that's and I say that as somebody who like as much as I love reading really really deep fiction and analysis of fiction, I love a pulpy story. Yeah. I will get through it so much faster. I, I think the the thing that separates it, what makes it more pulpy is Mass Effect explains everything. Yeah. To a degree that is re- realistic within the universe. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. Dragon Age explains everything within its in universe within its universe to a satisfactory degree for a fantasy game. Guild Wars is just like everything makes sense in universe, but they don't explain it all. You know, there's a logic to it, and probably the people writing it know what the logic is, but they don't feel the need to explain it to you within yeah. the game. Um, okay. You know, it's kind of like fill in your own fan fiction. Of why this happens. Well, I'm sure if you went to Archive of Our Own, there's a ton of stuff I filling I really should that check out. out that site. I've never looked into it. It's good. I mean, guys, secretly, I actually have some Dragon Age fan fiction there, but we won't get into really? that. <laughs> we won't. Yeah. So, anyway, finally coming to an understanding of the meaning of Irene's vision. So, basically, Irene can kind of see the future, kind of, but it's... It's not set in stone? It's not entirely that it's not set in stone. I was going to say, is she a precog? It's like she can kind of sense what the other dragons are doing and kind of get and kind of get a sense of what their plans are so not it's like always the, it's so it is also like the calling like this is very much yes but it's still more definitive than that it's hard to explain because it's visions so yes uh, and there's also prophecies of both glint and Kralkatoric. so yeah the guild at this point renew their efforts and now they understand all these things to track down and trap Kralkatoric one more time Keep in mind, we still have three more dragon encounters to go through. So wait, 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 wait. So let's go over the list of dragons again. Okay, Zaiten, dead. Yes. Modramoth, dead. Yes. That's it so far. Those are the only two that we've <laughs> killed. So wait, so we only weakened Dor- Primordus and Jormag. Jormag, okay. Yes. Okay, that's that's why I was confused. I was like, wait a minute, aren't those two out of the picture? They're no. not. Okay. So after a dragon flight through the mists, 
which is underselling the nerdy glee I felt playing through that. This feels like a Doctor Who crossover episode at this point. Uh, l- you're literally flying through different realms of reality, chasing Kralkatork through them. Oh my like, lord. Like that one Smash Brothers uh, Is there level. one where we become a pickle? <laughs> like- no. No, it's not to that degree, but like it's like that Smash Brothers level. Uh, it's one of the final destinations in the more recent Smash Brothers okay. where when you're fighting, like you keep just going to different worlds. Oh, I don't think I've experienced that yet. Yeah, but you're constantly flying. Like you'll be like, "I remember this. This was in like, you know, it tons of throwback moments and stuff, and by this point, you've earned them all. <laughs> okay, all right. But though, keep in mind, for Guild Wars, you don't have to play through or- in order. Like, if you own oh, it, okay. you can just jump forward to a thing, and it'll yes, and, it, and it'll assume canon choices were your choices. Okay, you know that's fair. So you can like start playing End of Dragons now, even though you have not played any of it, the previous stuff. So I, I would, you know me, I wouldn't do it like that. So. No, but if somebody just wants to get to the new and shiny, they can get to the new and shiny and then play the rest at their leisure. Yeah, you know? exactly. So Orin and her champion, basically you, mm-hmm. destroy Kralkatork's wings and bring him crashing out of the mists into Tyria once more, preventing the Tyrian magic in his possession from dissolving into the mists. And basically, he falls out of the mists, lands in the ocean... And gigantic chunks of islands from the mist, which is basically actually the realm, like these particular islands are the realms of, of like three of the gods, fall all around him, creating a whole new island. <laughs> Holy guacamole, he's changed the landscape just with being a jerk. Yeah. Wow. So Kralkatork's life finally comes to an end after Arena and the commander enter, basically walk through his mouth as he's kind of frozen in place. Uh, keep in mind, he's also a colossal creature. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's what I figured, yeah. Uh, they release the excess magic within and destroy Kralkatork's heart, literally called his tormented heart, I believe, in-game. Uh, in the presence of his grandchild, Kralkatork actually accepts his death and, in fact, welcomes the respite from the everlasting magical torment that he's been under. Basically, this feast and famine. So he, it's not even anything that he likes, he's just compelled to do it. Yes. Okay. Arena emerges from all this as a fully-fledged Elder Dragon, though she's a lot smaller than the others, but there may be... Like, she's not been gorging for yeah. thousands and thousands and thousands of years. She just got, like, a burst of energy. Yeah, she's basically the size of, like, a dragon in Skyrim. Oh. You know? So, maybe a little, <laughs> bit, maybe a little bit larger. So, yes. So, Sounds yeah, good. large... Large character, not colossal or gigantic. Well, the problem is every time you say a dragon in Skyrim, I just think of all the mods that make it not a dragon. <laughs> toot toot. toot, toot. <laughs> just literally, I think Mystic shared this video of the Thomas the Tank Engine mod, and I just could not. It was to the point where even the next day at work, somebody mentioned it, and I just was like, I couldn't do any work for like an hour. It was amazing. All so, right, moving on. shortly after this happens, shortly after we defeat Krakatoa, Jormag begins to put their plans into action. Now, it's not known how much of an influence Jormag has over the following events. Yeah. Um, it, it can be assumed that it's manipulated events long before anyone realized what was happening. I mean, we did see this with Modromoth, even while sleeping, can manipulate people. Right. So, given that this particular story more than most delves into politics and themes like racial purity. Oh. It's likely Jormag is playing the long game. <laughs> so Yikes. yeah. Yikes. We're about to get there. <laughs> Getting political. Yeah, luckily it's political. It's, it's Guild Wars politics. So okay. this is political, but I'll try to keep the names and everything to a minimum. We start with two char and a bow. Ryland Steelcatcher and Bangar Ruinbringer, I love char names, are planning to use Bram's bow, which they stole, and which is a bow of legend destined to kill Jormag. Basically, they're going to try to use this to control Jormag rather than kill him. Well, that sounds evil. Yeah. Yeah. Bangar also has plans to become Jormag's champion, basically get a power boost, and has grand plans to create a multi-continental char empire separate from the high legions that we've dealt with or been born into depending if you're a char player character this sounds like i want to be omnipotent i'll become a genie 
It's like some Aladdin <laughs> logic, right? Basically, he wants a Char empire of and for those Char who remain pure to Char ideals as he sees them. Quite literally, he says, warband above self, legion above warband, Char above legion, Char above all. An empire Char? An empire. <laughs> an empire Char. Um... This essentially prompts a civil war between Bangar's Dominion and the High Legions. Well, I don't think it benefits Char society to essentially isolate themselves from essentially the economy and culture they created connecting with the right. other the other races of Guild Wars. Yeah, and during this war, it's revealed that some of Bangar's Dominion forces have been corrupted by Jormag and now refer to themselves as the Frost Legion. So you have... Um, in the High Legions, you have the Ash Legion, which is kind of like spies and stuff. You have the Iron Legion, which is mechanics and tinkerers and stuff like that. You have the Blood Legion, which is the warriors. And you have the Flame Legion, which are the outcasts who pray to a different god. Or not a god. Different wh- different culture, basically. Yeah. And now they ha- now you have the, fro- the self-proclaimed Frost Legion. Within the main base of the Frost Legion, Bangar attempts to empower himself with the trapped Norn Great Spirits of the Wild. We mentioned those last episode. Oh, yeah. In order to control Jormag. The ritual is broken by the commander, and the opportunistic Ryland seals Bangar in a magical shield. Oh, so he has less competition. Yep. Yeah. In the aftermath, Jormag transforms Bangar into their voice. We've seen this, but it's not as... Yeah, not the same. Yeah, little more than a puppet, essentially. Yeah. And Ryland becomes Jormag's champion. Interesting. His voice and his champion. Yes. After Bangar's capture, the Civil War is more or less won, and Primordius' minions have begun to erupt all over Tyria in higher numbers than ever before. Jormag uses Primordus' attacks to justify sending Ryland in to seek help from the rest of Tyria in a tenuous alliance with him and the Frost Legion. Yeah, there's no way this is going to work out well. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, this is the area where, like, when they say Primordus' minions have begun to erupt all over Tyria, like, you will go back to maps and have to defend, like, these towns you saw years ago when your player character first, and en- like, was a fledgling character and defend them from Primordus' minions. But th- this, the idea of them popping out everywhere just makes me think they're, like, bursting out of the ground unexpectedly out of nowhere. And yeah. Are you kidding? Like, literally? Yeah, Primordus' minions are the ones of rock and fire. They just be like... Poosh. <laughs> oh, man, I thought I was making a joke. I didn't realize that that's actually how it happened. Yeah, no. I was going to say, it's like zits all over Tyrion. <laughs> So, knowing the twin dragons, because Primordus and Jormag are kind of twinned dragons, fire, ice, you know. Right, exactly. Are weak to the effect of one another, and feeling some form of personal responsibility for Ryland's ascension to power. Because, basically, Bram kind of let his guard down and got drunk with Ryland when he was buddy-buddy. Oh. But it was a ploy to steal the bow. (laughs) Right. Bram uses the spirits of the wild to become Primordus' champion. Whoa. To directly combat Ryland. This is a bad idea. It's not a great idea. As Oreen says, we have to respect him for it, even no matter how it shakes out. <laughs> like, I get I get, get why, but at the same time, I don't think that was a good idea overall. Like, that just doesn't seem like... That does not sound like something that in the long run is really going to work out for you or anybody else. Yeah, so because the two dragons are twin, the guilds need to find a way to force the dragons to destroy one another. Taking out one will only make the other one... Str- will not... Yeah, you have to. You can't take them out at the same time. It's kind of like they have to meet each other. Let them fight. Pretty much. So this is a battle between Tyria, Primordus, and Jormag. Basically a three-way battle. Uh, yeah, so Oreen, the commander, and all their allies lay in wait at a ley line nexus, we talked about those last episode, Ooh. at Anvil Rock. The Tyrian forces clear the destroyer minions there and install prismatic crystals, which Oreen can use to channel magical energy from different sources. Ooh. Yeah, Oreen's a different dragon than most. She is a prismatic dragon. Interesting. This will come into play. Is this, does this mean psionic powers out of curiosity? No. Okay, I was just I mean, wondering. Maybe I don't know. I don't know what psionic powers means. Well, so 
This is old. I'm referencing 3.5 D&D Monster Manual oh Guide. God. So don't even... Don't, don't, don't at me. I know that this is old. There was the Chromatic Dragons, which were the evil dragons. Mm-hmm. The Metallic Dragons, which were the good dragons. Mm-hmm. And then when they tried to introduce Psionics into 3.0 and 3.5... Some of the monsters they had were the prismatic dragons. Were dragons that are mostly crystals, and they were neutral, but they were psionically powered. Mm, I, my question was, what are psionics? I don't remember that part. Psionics was an alternate form of essentially kind of like magic. I brought that into a campaign that I had, um, just because I thought it was fun to have them, and it was um, essentially psychic powers versus. Uh, arcane powers so she has like telepathy with Kaith and the her champion yeah but not really beyond that like she can talk to the other dragons telepathy Mm -hmm. through telepathy but that's about it okay i was just curious it's 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 an idea that's rooted in just me linking it to other pop culture that has no bearing really uh so this spot has an abundance of magical energy which eventually draws ryland and seeing it clear of Primordius' minions, because yeah, the guild did the hard work, Ryland summons his army of Frost and Frozen. Now, Frozen are, like, he's been, like, corrupting people. Yikes. Like, so, we kind of skipped over a little bit here, where Primordius was erupting. Eventually, Jormag starts doing the same thing and corrupting people into the Frozen. You thought you could be a Tyria Zit. I'll be the best Tyria yeah. Zit. Okay, so... Ryland summons his army, and then Bram appears. Bram! Who's been running around Tyria also destroying stuff. Does he even have a will of his own at this point? Because he's corrupted, right? Yes. Oh? But it's, it's, it's really difficult, and it's going, it's like a, it's basically, they're running out of time. Oh, no. So, and basically, they just both start fighting. And he has, like, an army of destroyers behind him, too. Wow. And the, this clash of champions brings both elder dragons to the same spot, too. And, yeah, basically, they're just giving on this little tit for tat and just start, like, they're just fighting. So they least successfully have egg the dragons on yes. to fight each other. Okay. So using this battle as a distraction, Arene severs the magical links between the dragons and their champions. Yes. And then caught in the fear of battle, Primordus and Jormag leap at one another. Fire and ice fizzing out so much steam that the battlefield becomes obscured. Whoa. Okay. And then when the mist clears, this is actually a big cutscene, both dragons have been destroyed, having killed their counterpart. Bram is fine, mostly, as was Ryland, though not for long, as he dies attacking other Char, which is seriously understating what he does, but we don't have time. <laughs> he dies attacking other Char? Um... Yeah, uh, family of his that he he lunges at. We'll, we'll leave it at that. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, Whoa. basically they're ashamed of him, disown him, and he's like, ah, and then he dies. So Wow. Uh, and that's underselling it because of who his parents are, but we're not going to touch on it. So when the commander in Arene later on, so we have all the dragons but one have now been taken care of. Okay. So that one is the deep sea dragon. Oh. We haven't even named yet. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's right. Okay. So, so yeah, like, all the other dragons are dead. You have Zaitan, Primordius, Jormag, Kralkatoric, and Modramarth. All dead. One left. Deep Sea Dragon. So. Deep Sea Dragon? Yes. We'll get there. So. We'll get there? What is this? The next, like, version of Jaws? What's no, we're getting on? there in, like, in a minute. Okay. So, one of the commander's friends, named Gork and Asura, is kidnapped by the no. Aether Blades. Now, the Aether Blades were introduced way back in Season 1 with Scarlet Briar. They've been a little thorn there. They actually did a political assassination, too. Yikes! Uh, yeah. <laughs> we didn't touch on that. <laughs> we didn't touch on a lot of stuff this episode. We're skipping over a lot of things. Oh, no, that was last episode. We didn't touch on it. <laughs> or, okay, well, it just feels like... It's the Elder Dragons. We're just touching the Elder Dragons. No, that sounds I'm wrong. Not, I'm not... <laughs> it does sound wrong. <laughs> But I just wanted to, uh, I just, just wanted to emphasize that, like, 
to focus on the Elder Dragons. We yes. seem to be not touching on a lot of stuff. Yes. We could go back and do season one of Guild Wars as its own episode. Like, Yikes. Even though we've covered the whole basic plot of it, we could still cover it again. Other details of yeah. it. Okay. So the Commander and Irene fly into the mists to follow the Aether Blades and eventually end up way far away, crashing out of the mists and landing in Cantha. So in a totally different continent. Yes, a place that has had no contact since Or Rose. So it's been right. quite a while. <laughs> in Cantha, they come in contact with the Deep Sea Dragon, whose name is revealed to be Su Wan. Okay. It seems that Irene has been in contact with the Elder Dragon before at this point. Like I said, she, can, she could have talked to them, but didn't know really who she was talking to. It's just kind of like a voice. Oh, you know? interesting. Okay. Su Wan is actually not hostile. She's actually seen as Cantha's protector. In fact, when Zaitan and Or rose from the ocean and mm -hmm. flooded Tyria, Su Wan helped protect Cantha from it. Wow, okay. Yeah, so... And also, Cantha is very technologically advanced. It's on power with perhaps... Well, actually, it might be even slightly superseding the Asura in some ways. Oh, wow. Yeah, like, the Asura have, like, the waypoint system mm -hmm. that they've built through crazy technology and stuff. Even though they have no contact with the Asura at all since the Asura came out of... Like, they've never seen oh, a waypoint the portal. Yeah. They have their own, basically, equivalent technology. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. All their tech, though, is jade-based, but it's a peculiar form of jade. And jade is very abundant. Do you remember back in episode 45, we talked about the jade wind? Yes. <laughs> that turned the whole ocean into jade? <laughs> yes, that was a really, really eerie image that you yes. conjured there. When the commander is finally allowed to see the young reactor, basically the thing that's powering a lot of stuff, it's revealed that this is, it's basically Su Wan is the power source. Oh, yikes. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. We also find out here from Su Wan that she is the mother of the Elder Dragons. Oh. Yeah, this has been hinted at a little bit. Not that it was Su Wan, but that there was a mother figure. But we didn't realize that it was the, also Cantha's protector. Yeah, Su Wan created the other Elder Dragons to filter the magic of Tyria. Basically, it's oh. like a filter feeder system in a way. The Elder Dragon's influence was what allowed mortal life to even exist. Basically, yeah, we'll get there in a second. Um, this process, unfortunately, also drove the Elder Dragon's hunger for more magic and also slowly corrupts them. Because oh, not all magic is clean and pure. There is some corrupted magic no matter what you do. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So that's what kind of causes the destruction each cycle is slowly they've been corrupted over, over eons and right. they be hungry. Yeah. They be hungry. <laughs> so the young, Hungry, hungry yeah. elder dragons. They make it sound like there should be a version of hungry, hungry hippos. That's them doing that. <laughs> the, that's going to be in the next uh, Super Adventure Box. So Super Adventure Box is a... So I don't know if it's consistent now, but it used to be annual. I, it may be a permanent thing now. But it was like a week or two week long thing of like 16-bit era Guild Wars. Like everything was... Oh, wow. Yeah. It was pretty cool. It's a lot of platforming, so you'd hate it. No, I would hate it. You're absolutely <laughs> right. I would hate that. The Yang Reactor itself is made to take the excess magic from Su Wan, presumably allowing her to resist the corrupting influence as well. That excess magic is then used to power Kantha. Oh. Unfortunately, the death of the other Elder Dragons allowed their magic to flow back into Tyria and from there back into Su Wan and she is unable to filter all that magic alone. Oh, no. And part of the corrupted magic has started seeping into the jade, which causes just massive technical issues all over Cantha. Wow. Su Wan wants Orin to take her place as Ooh. the last elder dragon. Not quite what you're thinking yet. She predicts Orin's nature as a prismatic dragon allows her to filter the magic entirely by herself. She's not basically constrained and forced to, like, sh forced forcing the magic through her. It'll just kind of flow more naturally through her. Okay. Problem is, there is always someone who wants to make their mark on the world. <laughs> right. Enter the Asura, Anka. Uh-oh. She uses a magic weapon. This is, again, not even telling you 
close to what it actually does. To shoot dragon energy at Su Wan as a means to accelerate the end of the dragon cycle. We literally hear her say at one point, you can't fix anything by playing it safe. You have to burn it down so something better can grow in its place. No, no, that's not how, no, 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 that's not how it has to yeah, go. It also doesn't help that she's completely bored with existence. Like everything's just what? the same. Yeah. I do kind of love how she's written though. Like here's my favorite passage of hers. We're like ants scudding through life until we die. Then nothing's left but bones and rubble. The stars, the gods, the dragons. Our lives are a rounding error on the scale of their existence. Screw it. I won't be a rounding error. Boo! I like that line, though. <laughs> it's well written, but your philosophy's bad and you should feel bad. <laughs> Boo! I won't be a rounding error. The crazy error. thing Come is, on. that line of dialogue yeah. is optional. What? It is an optional line. It basically, there's one point you have to find a bunch of logs. You have to find six of them. Okay. And when you find six of them, you can go on to the next objective. There's an optional objective to find the last two. That is the last one. Wow. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, I like it in the sense of it builds a really interesting character, but also... It's her, a great... It's it's logic's flawed. That's it's all. A, it's a twisted logic and a twisted motivation, yes. but it's a good motivation, too, though. Right. Yeah. No, I like it. I like it in the way that it tells the story. So, least. unfortunately, all this excess dragon engine has been shot into Suwon. Basically drives her crazy, and she escapes the facility, which kind of wrecks a lot of stuff. Suwon, presumably in a half-conscious state, finds refuge in the Jade Sea and takes over the area around the Harvest Temple, erecting a barrier to protect the world from the Void, the form that the excess and corrupted magic takes within her. Oh, yikes. A united force, led by Dragon's Watch, breaks the barrier and temporarily subdues Su Wan. At the end of the battle, she's back to her senses, converses with Orin, revealing more about the nature of the dragons. Su Wan was alive even before the formation of the mortal world. Hmm. At the beginning, the magic of the world was in a primordial state of complete entropy, known as the Void. Okay. Makes sense. Also, I think we've heard this in Elder Scrolls. <laughs> yeah, it's a common theme. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Su Wan created the other Elder Dragons as tools to help her filter this chaotic magic into something less entropic that would allow the world of Tyria to form. They were initially created as mindless forces of nature, but later became self-aware and Su Wan accepted them as her children. Okay. Although they had a brief, happy existence as a family, at some point the other Elder Dragons changed and eventually went their separate ways, likely from the corrupting energy. Mm -hmm. From that point on, the dragon cycle was formed. The Elder Dragons would filter magic to not allow it to go back to the form of the void that was incompatible with mortal life, but in the process followed their hunger blindly, destroying whole mortal civilizations at the end of every cycle. It is a little unclear what Su Wan's behavior in the cycle actually was. I mean, she's not hostile now, but we don't know what was before that. Or what was she doing to filter it that's different than the way that those dragons were? Because maybe she's not filtering it as directly as they were because she wasn't planning for them to be her children. You yeah. know what I mean? They're supposed to be like a moss garden and suddenly it's Mothra's. Yeah. The commander and Irene then calls Suwon back to the Harvest Temple and extract the void from her. Hmm. This is, yeah. The extracted void manifests into a separate being attacking the commander and bringing the extractors that could stop it offline. Oh, wow. Basically a lot of gameplay, gameplay, gameplay. This allows it to go global. No. Trying to bring the whole world back to its chaotic state. No. In their fight to contain it all, the commander has to fight against the aspects of the previous Elder Dragons as their magic is now part of the Void. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Mm. In the end, obviously, the Void is defeated. Right. Su Wan dies. Oh. And Irin absorbs the last of her energy. Okay. Now Irin takes her place and becomes the sole Elder Dragon, Presumably able to filter the world's magic and resist the void in a much more stable way, which leads to a new cycle. Okay, so, but wait, the whole cycle now is just dependent on... Irene. Irene. 
And that's a lot. They literally, earlier this year, just released a tiny little snippet that I had to rush through to play through yesterday. (laughs) Oh my god. Including a really cringy, sappy dinner scene before this scene comes up. (laughs) I like a sappy dinner scene. But yeah, but it's also like awkward. Like the guy doesn't want to talk to his date because he doesn't. He's unco- it's oh. yeah. What's one of those? Well, my concern is that the the cycle with Irene is not entirely stable yet. Yeah, and in fact, that's my last paragraph. This new cycle will actually evolve. How this cycle will actually evolve, no one is certain. It's even Irene is not able to see past this point for the first time. Yeah, she has. No idea what lies ahead. Well, interesting. It's kind of like she was so connected to the past cycle that once it's gone, yes, part of her powers are gone. The one thing that she does need to do is figure out her own role. Basically, she needs to go someplace quiet yeah, and figure this out. And she doesn't know how long that will take. She hopes it's within the lifetime of the commander and Kaith. But for now... All she can do is say goodbye. Oh. Wow. And that's it. That's the other dragons. That's all we know so far. Guild Wars 3 <laughs> is like a thousand years later. She comes back. I figured no. it out. Um, so s- the next expansion is called Secrets of the Obscure. Uh-oh. It is coming out next month. Yikes. So I'm going to have to buy that. But it is basically now that the cycle is over... Yeah. Something in the mists has noticed it. And has decided to take advantage. Yeah, and they look dun, particularly dun, twisted. Uh, like, the enemies look really demonically twisted. It's kind of creepy. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah. So that's the that's the Elder Dragons. <laughs> that was a lot. Yeah, it was. That was very broad strokes. Yeah. Praise Joko. Bra- Sorry. <laughs> Praise Joko. I'm sorry. I was just watching that, and again, I recognized some of the voice actors from other stuff, and it was just funny to see them having oh. the fun with that. You know, I, before we even post this episode, I'm going to post that link on our Discord. If you like to c- catch our Discord, we have a channel on the Boss Rush Games Discord. Occasionally, I'll share through our stories on our Instagram the a way to get to the link so that you can you can yeah. join us there. Um, I also post a video. Can you post videos on Instagram? I didn't even know that. You can post very short videos oh, on so Instagram. Um, but if it it's one of those things that if somebody else posts it, I can always share something. So feel free to, if you find something that relates to what we talked about before, feel free to send it over on Instagram. I'd like to share it on our stories and credit you for sharing it with us. And I'm, I'm still debating on doing a Guild Wars Let's Play. I've been terrible at about Firmament, so I don't know how well it would go. But uh, Yeah, you've got two Let's Plays on your plate. Yeah, that's true. So focus on that. But that could be something if the Patreon gets bigger, we may be able to support having like an occasional like guild thing every once in a while. But I think we would want it to be bigger so that we could possibly devote money towards a babysitter. (laughs) Thank you guys for listening. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us on this crazy journey of the dragon cycle before we'll see the balloon dragon at Gen Con. Yes. So, um, this the Thursday before this releases to the public is our off weekend Let's Play. Yes. Where we're doing Mass Effect. We already mentioned that. Yes. So, we'll be doing that. So just keep in mind, so next week, Thursday, we are on vacation, which means we will not be doing a live stream on Thursday. We'll figure it out. We'll let you guys know. Please keep an eye on the socials for rescheduling or on the Discord. We will let you know in every way possible when you can catch us. But just keep in mind that, you know, next week there will not be a live stream and we will miss you. But thank you for listening. But thank you for listening. And thank you for your patience as we enjoy our vacation. Bye. Bye.